what do we really think of statues? I think the best place to start the story is at the end, if only for the fact that, in this case, it came so soon. The winter of Audrey Munson's life began in Mexico, New York, where she lived with her mother and worked as a door-to-door -door cutlery saleswoman. Mexico lies roughly 300 miles northwest of New York City, the place where Audrey most indelibly left her mark on the world. In her prime, she had been known around the country as Miss Manhattan and reigned in New York as the queen of the artist's studio. She possessed one of the most recognizable faces in America, yet in 1922, after a scandal destroyed her career, she moved to the country to live outside the public eye. In 1931, she was admitted to the St. Lawrence Asylum in Ogdenburg, New York. She died in the same asylum 65 years later. The question anyone would ask themselves is, how did this happen? I don't think anyone could definitively answer that. Over time, the lens of history warps and degrades the truth, and there are questions about Audrey Munson that may never be answered. What follows is, as best as I can tell, the story of her life. At 16, after a chance encounter with a famous photographer, Audrey was introduced to Daniel Chester French. Her career began posing in the famous sculptor's studio, and she quickly became the most sought-after nude model in New York City. There is a certain ethereal atmosphere about her that is rare. There is no monotony in her expression. It is a great satisfaction to find so much great and fineness of line combined. At the time, many people demonized Audrey's life and work as immoral, and the constant criticism inspired her own personal philosophy of nudity. Clothes we began to wear only when guile and evil thoughts entered our heads. Clothes ruined us. They do harm to our bodies and worse to our souls. We not only turn it into a passion for ornament, a lure for the senses, but girls even sell themselves and their souls for clothes. All girls cannot be perfect 36s with bodies of some mystic warmth and plastic marble effect, colored with rose and a dash of flame. Of course not. 
but clothing is more of a giveaway than the original self. I am perfectly candid about these things. I detest false modesty. For my part, I see nothing shocking in our unclothed bodies. The Pichirili family of sculptors carved the Fireman's Memorial on Riverside Drive. On one side, she cradles a child, while on the other she holds a dying man in her arms. The twin Audreys sit as if on two sides of a coin, on an unassuming street corner stones throw from the Hudson. Here she sits for the entire city to see, if they bother to look up. But when have you or I stopped in front of a statue of Joan of Arc or Athena and wondered about the flesh and blood woman in whose image it is made? Who has the time? It might be too much to ask everyday people to consider a statue for anything more than what it is on the surface. People have things to do and places to be, and in the constant tumult of our cities, where momentum is king, who cares about something that just sits still? But what do people think when they pass this corner of Riverside Drive? How many people know of the memorial's other role as a monument to a great American tragedy rarely told? Does anyone ever pass this corner and stare into the eyes of the muse personified? Do people walking their dogs in the park have a sense of the tragic history that lies behind the stone figure's blank gaze? Between 1915 and 1921, Audrey starred in four films, often playing the role of a nude sculptor's model. Her 1915 performance in Inspiration marks the first appearance of a nude woman in a non-pornographic film. Moralist organizations around the country banned her films, and preachers often sermonized against them. However, she still had her defenders, and the motto from Purity became the rallying cry against her detractors. Shame on him who thinks evil on it. Unfortunately, there was only one print of her third film, Purity, that survives today. Hidden deep inside the National Archives in Paris, Audrey's faded legacy means it could never see the light of day.
Pomona stands in the shadow of the Plaza Hotel and the surrounding skyscrapers. Her hair is arranged in tight corkscrew curls like a Flavian woman from ancient Rome. Her eyes are blank and her body is uncovered. Here she is, elevated literally and figuratively to the level of a goddess. Audrey was empowered by her nude form, and she often wrote with pride about the work that she did and the independence it bestowed on her. In contrast, the statue's surroundings illustrate the reality of Audrey's world, where being a woman of independent means made you a worthy target of moral reproach and slander. The masculine skyscrapers that tower above her on each side strip away any sense of grandeur the statue might have. In this world, a career was not a suitable pastime for a woman, and doubly so if she took her clothes off. The tragedy is that in less than half a decade, Audrey would be poor and unknown, reduced to the barest kind of existence. In 1919, a man named Dr. Wilkins became a tabloid sensation after he murdered his wife. He was also the Munson's former landlord, and the press was quick to connect Audrey to the Wilkins murder. Some papers suggested Audrey planned to elope with Wilkins following the crime. Though she was quickly cleared of all charges, the effects of the story were irreversible. By 1920, her career was put to an abrupt end as contracts were lost and work dried up. Following the loss of her fame, Audrey's life became filled with melodrama as she tried to regain some sort of footing in the press. She posted an ad in a local paper looking for an Adonis of physical ideal to marry, and at the same time calling herself the Syracuse Diana. She began recounting stories from her career in a column in the New York American, in which, among other things, she criticized the seamy side of the bohemian artists who used her up and cast her aside. I went to the artists for whom I had posed. They were kind, but actually there was no place for me. I had posed for them so many times that they had hundreds of sketches and rough drawings of my figure, my arms, the turn of my head, so that they really had no need for me anymore. The mental strain of the Wilkins case proved to be significant and long-lasting. In April of 1922, a year after the Syracuse Diana ad, she announced in an interview that she was marrying a flying ace aviator from Ann Arbor, Michigan named Johnson. However, after receiving a mysterious telegram a month later, she attempted to kill herself by overdosing on bichloride of mercury, and she never brought up Johnson or the telegram again. Two months later, in an interview with the pulp magazine Movie Weekly, she spun a fantastic tale of her life as a wartime spy hunter. The mounting lies could have been Audrey's way of grasping one last time at fame, but they also showed the beginning of her mental decline. Over the years, Mexico locals began to call her Crazy Audrey. She was frequently spotted wandering alone through the surrounding farmland, Her mother told the reporter, the poor girl feels that the whole world has turned against her. 
She only got $4,000. Well, four of her pictures are still on the road making money today. She should have had three million if she had her rightful share. In 1926, a tabloid reporter wrote, her face bears the mark of heartache and disappointments, and the figure that won the world is worn and wasted with illness and suffering. In 1931, a fate befell Audrey that has befallen many independent women throughout history. Though her mother continued to claim that her daughter was just nervous, a decade of obscurity punctuated by the occasional tabloid ridicule had taken its psychological toll on Audrey. A local judge saw fit to force her into treatment for a so-called mental blight in order to sweep crazy Audrey under the rug. Just as Freud considered hysteria an exclusively female disease, diagnoses like these have been used to subjugate women for centuries. At this point, Audrey's mother had little money and could do nothing to save her daughter. Against her will, Audrey was stripped of all agency in the name of treatment. She lived in the institution for the remaining 65 years of her life. Audrey Munson died on February 20th, 1996. She was 105 years old.